Well, good morning and welcome. We welcome those of you who are watching online as well. And Happy New Year. Uh, you made it. You got through 2022. You're still alive. Life is good. God is good. And we're able to come and worship him in this place. And it is a pleasure to be able to be here with you. One of the blessings about New Year's is that um, it's, it's a new beginning, right? It's a new chance to uh, kind of evaluate where you've been, what's going on, and where you're heading. And that's kind of what we want to do this morning, is we want to look back a little bit in order to help us to look forward. And so we're going to be in Psalm 63. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open to that uh, chapter. If you have your Bible app, you can open it there as well. Um, if you did not grab a communion cup as you came in, I want to encourage you to go ahead and go and grab that now, right at the end of the sermon. We're going to take communion together. Well, throughout all of history, there have been faithful men and women who have received the word of Christ, who have diligently sought him, and who have learned how to love them, love him with all that they are. And in their love for God, they, they found a regular habit, a daily habit of seeking him. Seeking him in his word, seeking him in prayer, desiring to abide by his will, live for his purposes, be led by his spirit in order to accomplish the kingdom work that they felt God had specifically called them to fulfill. And in this humble posture, in this desire to see God's kingdom built, these are people who did significant works. Some of them became pastors. Some of them became missionaries. Some of them had no intention of entering full-time ministry, but felt called and prompted by God to step out in a new way. Some started nonprofit organizations. Some looked for whatever way they could to meet the needs of the community around them, whether it was education or bringing clean water. There was a desire to see a healthier and better community around them. We see throughout history times when disease struck, that Christians were the first to run into the disease, regardless of what health concerns there may be for themselves. When calamity has struck, when disaster has arrived, they were some of the first ones to enter into the chaos, to start rebuilding cities, and to try and help those who lost everything in the storm. These are people who have learned how to turn a cheek when they're unfairly criticized, not feeling the need to defend their honor or really defend themselves at all, but instead let people think what they wanted to think, and simply followed the Lord. They were willing to share the gospel with the people around them. They were willing to reach out to those who were the least likely to receive it. These are committed believers who followed God in every way that they knew how, and when they got off track, when they fell short and into sin, they repented, they confessed, and they turned back to God and sought him with all that they had. When we look at some of these people, we, we read about some incredible stories that have taken place. One of my favorite books growing up, and I've shared this with you before, was Jesus Freaks by DC Talk. A book full of martyrs, people who had gone to different parts of the world to try and ex express the gospel, to share about Jesus Christ, to let them know their need for a savior, and were killed for it. They, they were willing to go to the point of death. They so believed, they were so convicted, they were so led by God's Spirit that there was nothing that was going to deter them because they were all in. Knowing that whatever hardship came their way, God could use it for his glory. When we think about these faithful brothers and sisters, there's a natural awe that kind of grabs hold of us. And we typically move them into some sort of category of their own, where they're the extraordinary, right? The, this is not your average day-to-day -day person, but really, if you look at it as far as a football game goes, they're kind of the X-factor player. 
exceptional people who simply went above and beyond to do whatever it is that God asked them to do. Have you ever considered the common theme among these people? Have, have you ever considered what were the similarities that each of them possessed? What, what were some of the things that kept them up and moving and, and allowed them to push forward even when they were exhausted? Even when they didn't have the strength in and of themselves, how was it that they were able to experience God in a fresh way so that they could continue to advance the kingdom lines? They were so committed, so focused, so faithful. How is it that they were able to keep from weariness and be excited about God all the way through? Because we've all kind of had interactions with people like this, right? People who, they, they carry some type of spiritual authority with them. When you interact with them, you, you can't help but talk about the Lord. You can't help but talk about church. You can't help but talk about the ways in which you've seen God moving or things that are going on in your life. They, they kind of a natural way of maybe drawing things out of you. And you share with them because you, you just know that they're trustworthy. You know that they have your best interest in mind. The common piece for these people is that there's a deep hunger, there's a deep thirst, there's, there's a deep craving inside that desires God and desires to be found in his presence. This is not an attempt to become theologically savvy and simply understand everything that the Bible says from a mental level, but rather this is a spiritual level where they're stepping back from the mental. They use what they learn from the Word of God. They apply it. They understand theology, but that's not the goal. The goal is to use a correct understanding of Scripture to rest in the presence of God, to look for new ways for Him to be honored, to be glorified, to be exalted, and to be, be seen as who He is rather than who I've heard Him to be. Because a lot of us lean on things that we hear as much as we lean on our own personal time with God. And so really, as we look at these people, what we want to consider is the quality time that they were able to spend with God over the course of a lifetime. And how that quality time with God, that desire to be found in his presence on a daily basis, affected them from the inside out and gave them this exceptional X-factor ability, this ability to interact with us in a way where we know that we can trust them, we know that we can walk through life with them, we know that we can do ministry with them, and we believe that God's hand is on them because of the way that we see him working through them. So our desire this morning is to do the same thing corporately, together, to come and to look at Scripture through this lens, to try and have a correct understanding of what it's saying in order that we might better worship God, that we might better exalt Him for who He, who he is, that we would be led by His Spirit to do what He has called us to do, both individually and collectively. So before we enter into Psalm 63, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the chance that we have to come and to be together and exclaim that you are worthy, that you are the high king of heaven, that you are the lion of Judah, that you are the one who was promised since the beginning, that you are willing to come and do all that you've done to live the perfect life, to die on the cross, all so that we can have an immediate present relationship with you. God, we love you, we are committed to you, and we pray that this morning you would take us through your word, that you would reveal to us through your spirit what you have for each person in this room. That we would walk out of this room having experienced you in a new way, knowing you in a new way. God, we commit ourselves to you and pray that you would be greatly honored in this time. In your name, amen. Psalm 63, starting in verse 1, it says, O God, you are my God. 
Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as the fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed, and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt him. For the mouths of liars will be stopped. As we look at this psalm, it is clear that David has a heart for God. He spent time in his presence ever since he was a boy. Out in the fields, he was writing songs, right? He was playing his harp. He was someone who knew how to have time alone with God that wasn't just time set aside for God, but it was intentional quality time. It was restful time. He spent lots of time on his knees in prayer. We see example after example of David stopping and praying before making a decision, asking God, should I do this? Should I enter into this? God, what is it that you want from me? How do you want me to move further? We know that David spent lots of time in prayer and in song additionally because of all of the psalms that he wrote. If you read the two psalms that come before 63, both are written by David and both speak of his desire and his thirst, that that inner craving that he has to be in the presence of God. He was a person who came to understand the significance of God and the shallowness of the world. And he couldn't get enough. The context of this passage is fairly significant for us to understand. This is actually after Absalom had declared himself king and David is on the run again. Out in the middle of the desert, he decided to flee and We might look at that with all kinds of different lenses, but what we see in this is David doesn't choose to fight Absalom. He doesn't choose to play some type of political game to win the people of Israel and to maintain his kingship, but instead, he avoids the politics, he avoids defending his name, his reputation, he avoids the conflict, not because he's scared of it, but because he's a man who loves his son. He's a man who loves the people of Israel, and he doesn't want to see division creep in. He's a man who loves God and wants what's best for God's people. And so instead of causing all kinds of strife, instead of allowing for trouble to sink in, he simply allows himself to be removed and even considers the possibility of whether or not This is God's doing. This is God's moving. But by the end of this psalm, we see that he refers to himself as the king still. He understands that rightfully before God, that God's spirit is still on him, that God put him in that position as the anointed king over Israel. And he maintains that identity, understanding that it is the identity that God had given him. And to his understanding, God had not removed it Yet, so what we see is this man who is on the run, who is in the desert, who has done this before when Saul was chasing him. And as he's surrounded by the dry desert, as he looks at really everything that's around him, the Dead Sea, which is water just full of salt that you can't drink, 
there's really only one place for him to go in the desert, and that's in Gedi, where there's this fresh spring, this waterfall that kind of trickles down through a valley. And I can only imagine what it was like traveling from Jerusalem to there. Having been to Israel and uh, made that trip by bus, I can only imagine how dry your mouth would get by the time you get there. How weary you would be just looking for that water, just thinking about how badly you need that water. Certainly he brought water with him, but you have to be mindful of how much you drink. There's, there's a trip ahead, and he had people with him. And so as he's thinking about his position, as he's thinking about where he's at and what's going on in his life, his livelihood being threatened, his health being threatened, Absalom is actually willing to kill him to solidify the kingship. He's taken blow after blow after blow. So the desert doesn't just represent the dryness of the thirst of his body, but also the dryness of his spiritual condition as he has taken punch after punch. As he is enduring a significant hardship. And in all of this, he lays out this really exceptional model for us. He turns to God and he seeks him. He says, as I thirst for that water, so I thirst for you. As I thirst for that water, I thirst for those moments in your presence, those moments that I've had in your sanctuary where I was able to stop and just lift up my hands and praise you as the one who is worthy. He's seeking God. He's exalting God in the midst of hardship. He's laying aside the challenges that he faces, and instead he leans into what God has for him. And this model isn't just a good idea for us. I would actually say that this model is a prescription for us. It's something that isn't just interested in alleviating the symptoms that we experience, but rather it's a prescription for the soul that will give us a holistic change and will be life-giving for all of eternity. A prescription that will resolve the root of the problem so that the surface symptoms can no longer have their way with us. And as it works on the root, these symptoms are relieved, sometimes in surprising measure. The prescription that's being demonstrated is this deep hunger and thirst for God. And when we look at it in a practical way, in, in a year where the economy has been very challenging, and there are many who are in this room who have suffered um, great loss percentage-wise, money can be a tough topic right now. It can be a challenging battle that you're facing. But the reality is the more that you hunger and thirst for God, the more time that you spend in his presence, the more that you have this ongoing, personal, day-to-day -day relationship where you are praising and exalting him because he is worthy, the less need you have for money. The less care you have for money. Because the reality is that God is going to do with you what he has. God is sovereign, and he will take care for you, and he will provide for you in the way that he has planned. And that becomes a reality that you're able to live into rather than wonder if that promise is true for you. It also relieves the anxiety of uncertainty. When, when we have deep, meaningful times of connection with God, that anxiety that builds up in situations that have developed that we, we don't know how to handle this. We've, we've tried to speak to this person. We've tried to help them understand the other person's side. We've, we've tried to enter into the mess, whatever's going on. And it just doesn't seem like there's any resolve in sight. It can help alleviate that. Maybe not the challenge of the situation, but certainly the anxiety that we buy into. Because we can lean into God in such a way where we can have confidence that through and through, he's going to use this for his glory. That there's going to be a way that he works this together for good. And maybe it doesn't play out the way that we think it should, 
but we know that God is at work, that God is going to do what he is going to do. When we spend this time with God, when we have this intentional quality time where we are hungering and thirsting after him, my fame, my reputation, things that are said about me are less and less important. Because the more that I spend time with God, the more I realize this life isn't about me. It's about him. Knowing that God has redeemed me as a child of his, I don't have to worry about what people say. I only have to worry about what he says. And that's a reality that we sometimes struggle to live into, but the more time that we spend with God, the more time that we have in his presence, the more naturally we can live that out. When I have a deep hunger and thirst for God and seek him diligently, my own health becomes less significant. Because the reality is, I know that after I die, after this life is over, I have the promise of eternity in the presence of our Heavenly Father. There is no challenge. There is no fear. There is no anxiety. There is no need outside of having a deep, committed, intimate relationship with Jesus. He will take care of the rest. That doesn't mean that we are called to be lazy, right? To simply dwell on him and just assume that somehow he will always give us money so that we can find food. It, it's not to assume that I can just sit in my lazy boy all day and assume that somehow God will feed me. We are called to be workers. We are created to be workers. We are to do our due diligence, but in doing our due diligence and entering into this work, we are to bring God with us and not leave him on the sideline. David's example reveals a heart for God, a heart that was molded and shaped in the quietness of prayer. It was molded and shaped in the courtrooms of worship, in the sanctuary that he speaks of, and in his faithful response to God. The faithful response, I think, is often the place where we get lost, where we go, you know what, I can spend time in prayer, you know what, I can come to church, I can worship, I can, I can lift my hands and I can feel great about being a Christian. But there are times when God prompts, God convicts, he asks us to step into something and we don't engage. David engaged. That's, that's the full piece of the prescription. If you spend much time around doctors and nurses and physical therapists, one of the things that you will hear about is reoccurring patients who have the same issue that could be resolved. They've been given a prescription, and they follow it a little bit, but not to the full extent. They've been given a schedule to, to strengthen that arm, to strengthen that shoulder, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. Uh, Taylor Wilson is not here, so I will be honest. <laughs> I, I injured my shoulder earlier this year, and my recovery time was about two months ago. It was supposed to be good. We're getting there. But sometimes we don't step into the full prescription. Sometimes we say, prayer is enough, worship is enough, reading my Bible is enough, doing this is enough to get to where I want to be. But the problem is it's still about me. The problem is it's not yet about him. And when it becomes about him, then the engaging piece in whatever he asks us to do, entering into the full prescription, no longer becomes a problem. It may be challenging, it may be difficult. It may feel like you're having to let go of areas of life, let go of control that you have hung on to for a long time. But the other side of that is so much better. Getting to have that experience with God, being in his presence, being used by him, and seeing him use you in ways that you didn't know you could be used. There is something so rewarding about that. It is so deeply and richly rewarding. So let's go back and 
Let's take a closer look at some of this. Psalm 63, starting in verse 1 and 2, it says, O God, you are my God. David starts by identifying who God has positioned him to be. He understands, I am a child of God. I am owned by God. I am seeking God. He is my focus. That's who I'm going to orient around. He says, earnestly, I seek you. You are what is on my mind. I am not wasting time scrolling through social media. I am not wasting time doing this or getting distracted or working too much. But I am bringing you into everything that I am doing. I am focused on you. I am oriented around you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Every part of who I am desires your presence, desires to be with you and to see you exalted as the one who is worthy. As in the dry and weary land where there is no water, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. And those are two key elements to this entire passage, God's power and his glory. We might first look at this psalm and assume that it's about David. And while there is some relational tie-over because our God is relational, this is a psalm that is focused on God's power and his glory what God has done, what he is doing, and what he's going to do. And none of that can be thwarted. So let's take a look at how David unpacks these two ideas a little bit. In verses 3 to 6, what we see is this description as well as experience of God's glory. Let's read that again. It says, Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. Because David has experienced God, because David has been in the courtrooms where he has been interacting with the presence of God, he knows his glory. And because he knows his glory, he can't help but praise him. He can't help but exalt him. He can't help but turn and worship God. And this is not some form of momentary praise, but in verse 4, he confirms that this is a lifelong disposition where he is going to rest in the presence of God. He's going to seek after him to the best of his ability, and he's going to exalt him as the one who is worthy. Why? Because interacting with God is a powerful change in your life. Interacting with God, being in his presence, wrestling with who he is and what he has for you, letting go of this world changes you. That is the simple power of God's glory. It's, it's the same thing that we saw in the shepherds. We just went through the Christmas story. And two weeks ago, we talked about the shepherds. And they heard the good news from the angels they went and saw Jesus. As soon as they saw Jesus, as they're leaving, it says, and they praised and worshipped God. The natural reaction to being in the presence of God is to praise and to worship God. And then there's one more piece. Beyond the praise and the worship God, the next piece is that the shepherds went and told everyone who would listen. There is an engagement piece beyond the prayer and the worship. There is a calling piece beyond the praise and the worship. The praise and the worship starts in the quietness of your heart. It starts in your studying the scripture and exalting God in your personal time with him and even preparing yourself in one way or another to come into this room and to collectively worship God together. And when we prepare ourselves in that way, when we guide our mind and our spirit in that way, what we find is this natural, organic peace within us where we can't help but praise and worship God. But from there, we have to take that out to the people around us. God calls us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. David's posture here is one that understands the sweetness 
of being in God's presence, the change of heart that happens when you experience the glory of God in your own life. In expressing God's glory this way, David rightly portrays God as the most significant being. And he has this desire inside of him that he can't help but worship. He can't help but see God's glory spread and be an active part of helping others to know how great and awesome is this God. As we look at history, there's a reason that we have these exceptional believers, these, these exceptional pastors and missionaries and, and people who just served their community in whatever way that they could find. And they were exceptional, not because they had some extra magic potion in them or some extra magic gifting that nobody else has. They were exceptional because they were no longer the person that they were before. They had encountered the glory of God. They had rested in his presence. They had worshiped and magnified his name. And as a result of their time with God, they were changed. And they entered into a faithful life of living out what they believed. Exceptional people are exceptional because they've been radically changed by experiencing the presence of God. Let's continue to look at how David points to the power of God in verses 7 and 8. He says, For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. As we look at this, David takes credit for nothing. Of the things he has accomplished, of the different trials that he has overcome, of his life to this point, of navigating the hardship of being best friends with Jonathan, having Saul trying to kill you, and being the anointed king. David faithfully followed God in that season. And David faithfully followed God as king. He fell short at times, right? We, we know that he had a significant struggle for at least a year of his life. But in that, even in that, we see that David is faithful in this way. When Nathan comes to David and says, you've sinned against God in this way, go read David's response. 2 Samuel 11. He says, I have sinned. And then he goes into weeping and mourning and fasting. David looks at his life and he takes credit for nothing. Instead, he says, in the shadow of your wings, you've protected me. You have guided me. You, you have led me. The only reason I am here is because of the ways that you have provided for me. And he even identifies that I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for your right hand upholding me. That in those times of weariness, it was your strength, not mine. It was what you were doing, not what I was doing. God's strength and power is demonstrated through and through in the life of any believer who has done anything for his kingdom. In this psalm, David's putting God's glory and power on display. And he's intentionally trying to orient and, and to shift his focus so that he is only focused on God. And his desire is that in this weary state where he's traveling through the desert, that he would again rest in the presence of God. That he would again find a fulfillment, a renewal of spirit, and that he would have confidence and strength and hope because he knows that the Lord is at work. David's spiritual appetite is craving God's fulfilling presence. And so I think the question that we have to stop and ask is, what is my spiritual appetite? The reality is we all have one, and we all manage it in different ways. We all fill it with different foods. We all have different ways 
in which we take care of that. One example I think of, um, and this didn't really start happening to me until I had kids, so I'm going to blame it on them. But after we started having kids, I started getting these cravings at about 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. And I think most of the men in the room are going to be like, mm-hmm. And, you know, you can't go to the fridge and you rummage around and you're looking for different foods and there's nothing there that you really see that you want. So you look in the pantry and then you think to yourself, well, maybe there's still a frozen pizza in the freezer. And you kind of look all around and there's nothing that really is catching your eye in meeting what you know that craving is. And so instead of dwelling on that for a moment, identifying what the craving actually is, in finding the correct way to fulfill that, we kind of grab a couple scoops of this leftover, and that kind of meets a certain piece of the craving, and then, you know what, I need some salt too, so I, I grab some chips and I eat half a bag of chips and put that back, and then, you know what, there's something, I need something sweet too, so I grab the ice cream and I start putting the ice cream down. Pretty soon I've eaten five or six or seven different foods. And at the end of it, I feel full, but I feel like garbage. Because the reality is, God has created each one of us with a craving. And that craving is for him and for him alone. And we have to be intentional about dwelling on exactly how to pursue that. Exactly how to find the right ingredients to seek him, to know him, to rest in his presence. And it's not going to happen by grabbing the closest thing that's pleasurable. It's not going to happen by just filling ourselves with whatever we feel like watching or listening to or seeking after. Our, cry, our craving is meant to be something that builds inside of us a holy disposition where we are set and focused on the person of God. Where our desire, our thirst, and our hunger is fixated on the person of God. The second question we have to ask is, am I craving with deep desire to be filled and encouraged by the presence of the Almighty God? How are you filling your spiritual appetite? What junk is being consumed? Beyond that, what junk are you living out? This idea of David hungering and thirsting after God is more than prescription. Holy disposition means that there, there's a posturing of heart, there's a, there's a posturing of mind that is wholly determined to seek God, that is fixated on what he has, that is oriented around him. It, it's this desire to always be filled with the Spirit. And whenever there's a sinful error, that there's a correction made, there's forgiveness that is sought, there is confession to get realigned and to be on the correct track and to diligently seek out God with all that we have. The call of the Christian is to learn how to have this holy disposition this holy desire, this longing to worship. Starting next week, we're starting a new series, and, and it's going to take us through the month of January. So really, it's prayer month is what it is. And in this month, our, our theme is, it's time. In these next few minutes, I, I want you to do your best to just receive this from the Lord, recognizing that in this moment, perhaps this is the time that God is using to prepare you for this upcoming month. 
that in this month, when we are focused on prayer, when we are focused on seeking God collectively as a church, that there is something that God is doing in you to prepare you for this month because he has significant work for you to do going forward. And so what, what I want to ask is, where have you been hanging on to something in your life that you need to let go? Where, where is there sin that is active? Perhaps it's the need to control certain situations. Maybe it's a pattern of manipulation or gossip or drunkenness or whatever, whatever it may be. Is there a sinful pattern that has got you off course? Is there a way in which you're treating the people around you that is not of God, that is not for his kingdom? Perhaps there's something that God has called you to do. Maybe it's not a sinful pattern, but God has asked you to step into a situation. He's asked you to engage in a new way. He's asked you to cut off a certain piece of your life or surrender control of a situation. God is standing there waiting for you to hand that over to him. He's not pushing himself on you. He's not shoving. He's going to let you do what you want. But he's standing there asking you, are you ready to have this holy disposition? Are you ready to have this inner craving that desires him? Are you ready to let go of these these little junk foods that we keep snacking on and learn how to be holy, all in, all out for Jesus the Christ. I think for a lot of us, it it sounds hard. It, it sounds like too big of an adjustment. It sounds like letting go of too much, too big of a shift. When maybe there's this idea that I'll become this weird Christian. All it takes is a little bit of seriousness and the discipline to seek God each day. And as you seek God each day, what you will find is a growing desire for him. But you, you have to be committed to this. This isn't something that accidentally occurs. In David's life, it started out in the fields with his harp. And his discipline of seeking God, of having that personal quiet time, that personal seeking of his presence, is something that moved from discipline to joyful habit. And that joyful habit in time turned into this this holy disposition, this desire to seek God, to know God, to be with God. And so really what I'm presenting to you today is this idea of not just you, not just me, but all of us as a church, grace, learning what it means to have this holy disposition. Not just being an exceptional person or a few people, but an exceptional church that deeply, profoundly loves God, is led by his spirit, and through that, reaches out to the community around them. Through that, trusts God in each and every of the situations that we would be filled with the Spirit, that we would carry his banner forward, and that his presence would be experienced not just by us, but also the people in Delta County. For a long time, grace has been able to influence people in this county, in this area. We have seen a number of people come to Christ over the years, and we have gone through some hardships. We have experienced some pains as a congregation, but there is a time and a place to get reoriented and to stop licking the wounds and start moving forward. In this next month, our theme is, it's time. It is time to seek God in this way. It is time to let go of control. It is time to become the church that he has called us to be. And if we seek him in this way, if, if we can learn how to have this seed of desire in us, God's going to move. God is going to move. 